In my last lecture, I looked at several images of the human body made by women who were asking viewers to rethink the way they directed their gaze. This artist, while also a woman, deliberately chooses not to emphasize the gender of her figures, hence the title's reference to the term androgynous. So what message do you think the artist is sending with these dramatic, incomplete figures? Bodies without skulls, bodies without heads, torsos without legs, and why are they hollow? To start with the last question, Abba Kanowitz saw her family home attacked by Nazis and then seized by Soviet occupiers. So here's a quote from the artist about that experience. As our home and countryside receded, I felt increasingly hollow, as if my insides had been removed and the exterior, unsupported by anything, shrank, losing its form. This short video clip not only talks about Magdalena Abakanowitz's background, but also gives you a look at some of her other early work. The artist spent some time working in a hospital and later studied human anatomy. This experience may offer another reason for her rather strange choice of medium. Pieces of coarse burlap, which she sewed and pieced together, bonding the sculpture with synthetic resin. The rough texture captures some of the look of internal organs, muscles, and veins. Here again are the artist's own words. After many years, soft things of complicated tissue have become my material. I feel a kinship with the world which I do not want to know, but through touching, feeling, and relating to the part of myself which I carry deep inside me. In, other, in another interview, she refers to man's horrible powerlessness against this biological structure. Very ambivalent relationship to the body. So here's another set of works that captures this effect especially well. In fact, I think the College Board's chosen example of Abba Kanowitz's work leaves out an important element of that work and of her message. Usually, her hollowed out and incomplete human figures appear in large, anonymous groupings. Because she hand models each figure, each individual sculpture is unique, yet the impression is one of anonymous crowds. Again, here's an explanation from the artist. I happened to live in times which were extraordinary, times of collective hate and collective adoration. Crowds worshipped leaders, apparently great and good, who soon became mass murderers. So perhaps her androgynous figures are not merely victims, but also in a way perpetrators of global tragedy. Let me just note she sometimes casts her work in bronze. Here's a recent example in the same distinctive style. So I was drawn to this painting immediately, its vivid expressionist use of colors and its sense of movement and energy. And I got even more excited about this work when I learned more of its story and the story of its 84-year-old painter, encouraging to my ancient self. Emily, sorry, I am not going to try to uh, pronounce and therefore butcher her last name, was born at the beginning of the 20th century and grew up in a remote desert area in Australia's outback in a community known, some would say ironically, as Utopia. I've circled Utopia on the image of Australia and included a photo. That dirt road is the main highway to her community. As your reading noted, European settlers established huge cattle stations in the outback, and once nomadic Aboriginal pe peoples were resettled on these farms as laborers. They only regained the rights to land in 1976. By the way, our artist was deeply involved in the fight to pass the Aboriginal Land Act of 1976. She and others from her clan performed a ceremony before a Bush hearing of the Land Claim Tribunal demonstrating the powerful nature of art as evidence for showing a connection to country. The ceremony involved retelling Dreamtime creation stories and also included body painting. I have a photo here on the upper right. For virtually two-thirds of her life, however, Emily had only occasional contact with the outside world. It was not until she was about 80 that she became, almost overnight, an artist of national and international standing. But she had long had great standing within her own community, serving as an elder of her people and as a lifelong custodian of the women's dreaming sites in her clan country. Since the concept of dream time or creation is so central to Aboriginal people's worldview and to this required work of art, I'd like you to watch this video clip. You'll also get a glimpse of the landscape that our artist has captured, especially the landscape after the onset of the rainy season brings greenery to an otherwise very dry landscape. 
1978, Aboriginal women began making batik cloth based on traditional Aboriginal earth and body paint designs. This was a government-sponsored education program designed to help, help the women find a source of income and by demonstrating the economic viability of the outstations to bolster their moral claim to the land. Here you see a collection of batiks from Utopia and one of Emily's own batik designs on the left. The highly original designs quickly caught the eye of art dealers, and by 1988, Utopia Women's Batik Co-op had more than 80 members. In an effort to expand the market for Aboriginal art and the economic base of these communities, a gallery in Sydney, Australia, provided acrylic paint and canvases to the women of Utopia. Two weeks later, the curators at the gallery returned to Utopia and found works such as these, Emily's first painting, created when she was almost 80 years old. As your homework reading notes, this work was selected for the cover of the exhibition catalog, mostly as a gesture of respect for the artist's seniority, as she was the oldest artist from the community. Emily went on to produce over 3,000 paintings in the course of her eight-year painting career. In 2007, Earth's Creation became the first work by a female Australian artist and the first Aboriginal artwork to break the million-dollar mark at an art auction. The painting captures the artist's vision of the Earth's creation and its recreation each year as the rains bring new life to a parched landscape. The technique she and other Aboriginal acrylic painters used is called dump dots, raw stripes or dots of paint smeared into the surface. This short video clip gives a more complete description of the method, which you'll also note is really a kind of action painting. And here is one of the last paintings that Emily made before her death. Note that her technique continued to evolve. One art blog I visited compared this with the works of the New York School of Abstract Expressionists and conjectured that this was further evidence of Jung's collective unconscious. Maybe so. I talked about this work, admittedly only briefly, back in our Asian art unit, but you have more global contemporary context now for it. So let's make another comparison. What similarities and differences do you see between these two works? Both paintings are abstract renderings of nature, with titles that suggest which elements of nature inspired them. I didn't assign any textbook reading about this work, but a passage in Gardner's Art Through the Ages explains that Song Su Nam was one of the founders of the Oriental Ink Movement in the 1980s, and that his work owes a lot to post-painterly abstraction. That's the same category into which most art historians place Frankenthaler's The Bay. Both artists employ a method that takes advantage of diffusion, that is, thinned paint on unprimed canvas. In Frankenthaler's case, diluted ink, and in Song oh, uh, diluted paint, diluted ink, and Song Su Nam's work, sorry, I'm losing myself in my own notes. The obvious big difference is that Frankenthaler uses color very exuberantly. Back when I was talking about Korean art, I mentioned that Korean artists were heavily influenced by artistic trends in China. Remember this Confucian-style portrait of a high-ranking Korean official? We can still see something of a shout-out to ink landscape paintings in Song Su Nam's Summer Trees. So what similarities and differences do you see between these two ink techniques? Well, the Chinese work is clearly more detailed. Brushstrokes allow for more realism and perhaps more nuance. But both works rely on subtle gradations of shading that ink can provide. Both also use a contrast between light and dark spaces to delineate space. Although, of course, Song Su Nam does this in a much more abstract fashion. Summer trees also represent a movement within Korea, both to rediscover traditional artistic techniques and also to reinvent Korean art along unique national but also modern lines. It's worth remembering that Korea was occupied by Japan during World War II and invaded by China during the Korean War. It's hardly surprising that Korean art took a somewhat nationalist turn in the 1960s. I put the author's own explanation of his motives up on the slide. I was curious about Song Su Nam's reference to Korean ink wash traditions, so I did a little research, and here are two of the images I found. Note that they're made almost five centuries apart. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an artist's name for either work. Okay, snark alert. Did we really need two female Japanese artists who've gotten rich marketing themselves and some of the tackier elements of pop culture? I'm done snarking, for at least a minute. I talked about this work a little when we discussed Buddhist art. 
Amitabha or Pure Land Buddhism is an ancient branch of Buddhism and it's also today one of the most popular forms of Buddhism in East Asia and in the United States. Pure Land Buddhists emphasize a personal relationship with Amitabha Buddha who is regarded by Pure Land Buddhists as a savior. Followers of the Amitabha Buddha also believe in the Pure Land, sometimes called the Western Land, a place which provides a stepping stone toward enlightenment and liberation. So here's a 13th century Tibetan rendition of the Amitabha Buddha with attended bodhisattvas. So what Buddhist imagery do we see here? Well, the elves apparently are attendants and maybe bodhisattvas. The lotus flower is a potent Buddhist symbol. The lotus blooms in stagnant, polluted water, a sign that beauty can prevail even amidst the ugliness of worldly desires and distractions. The lotus blossom also simula uh, symbolizes rebirth into paradise, the pure land. According to the Khan Academy essay you read for homework, I hope, the fantastical object which resembles a playful futuristic spacecraft with arms may be a variation of a Tibetan stupa. Remember, those are the sacred buildings that held relics of the Buddha. Hmm. Mariko Mori started off as a leader of the Japanese craze for costume play, in which adolescents and adolescent adults use elaborate costumes and makeup to transform themselves into manga and anime figures. Cosplay has come to this country as well. I actually encountered a gang of teenagers dressed up in costume when I was walking my dogs in the Palo Alto Park just recently. I asked them what they were doing, and they answered cosplay. I had never heard of it, and now I'm using the term for a podcast. So here are a couple of images of the artist from the mid-1990s. Mariko Mori actually began her career as a fashion model before attending art school, and most of her art seems to be images of herself. Also a deliberate reflection on popular culture, but maybe some self-promotion as well. I'm going to read from an also rather snarky review of Pure Land's opening at the Tokyo Museum of Contemporary Art in 2002. Quote, Sometime around the middle of her career, Mori morphed into a New Age Eastern Goddess character. The transition began with the Shaman's Prayer, a 1996 video installation in which a futuristically costumed Mori dreamily caresses a crystal ball while standing in the new Kansai International Airport. Let's watch a few seconds of this. That, by the way, is a cyborg. Uh, I'm going to continue with the review. Mariko Mori's spiritual affectation evolved in ambitious three-dimensional videos such as 1997's Nirvana, in which viewers don special glasses to watch as Mori is born of one of those seven floating balls of light and flutters feathers outward from her fingertip. A droplet of, I'm guessing, life energy forms in Mori's midsection before floating off through the heavenly landscape which surrounds her. It returns to Mori and is sucked back inside her. The remaining balls of light, meanwhile, become little pastel-hued pixies, and one plays a mandolin while the others make cute little squeaking sounds and hover around their beloved Mori, who's dressed in a flowing silk kimono and can fly. End quote. I do not think this viewer was impressed. But the College Board obviously thinks this is an important work of art, so I'll share a more flattering review. Mori is fascinated by the way contemporary Japanese society balances technology, fantasy, and humanity. With an affectionate perspective on her native country, she explores the way fantasy and reality overlap in contemporary Japanese consciousness. Here's a world where cartoon characters step out of comic books to stalk the real streets, and real people withdraw from their grim routine to lose themselves in cartoon fantasies. And, this is a McConnell edition, maybe they're seeking spiritual enlightenment as well. So here's the artist's own explanation from an interview with the Journal of Contemporary Art. When I went back to Japan after a long stay in New York, I thought that the youth culture was most energetic. Up till then, culture consisted of Western simulations and fakes imported from abroad. I was absorbed and stimulated that they were so original and so powerful. Okay guys, confession time. I'm way out of my comfort zone here. I have never engaged in cosplay. I've never been to any of the superhero movies that flood the theaters. I don't get anime, and I find both of these artists amazingly and irritatingly narcissistic. But 
They are both enormously popular and they have both obviously captured something in our culture that draws many people to their art. So I'm going to close this podcast by opening a discussion, which I hope you have time to have. What do you think about these artists?